Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angie. I am a violinist by training and a cultural entrepreneur by conviction. And I'm also a Latina woman, a adoptee, hence why you may be trying to put a face on my last name. And I'm also a millennial, an only child, an immigrant from Ecuador, and many other adjectives that we may use to describe ourselves or others. And this is my own intersectionality. So this is a picture of my mother and I. We moved to the United States when I was eight years old. We had no idea where Connecticut was even on the map. And I don't exactly recall how I learned to read, write, and speak English, but I only credit it to having a good musician's ear. So growing up, my mother had three jobs. One job she used to pay our rent. The second job she used to buy groceries. And the third job was for my music education. So I realized that even though she may not have been able to be as present as other parents in my education, in my after school activities, in my concert, she was so invested in giving me an education and giving me a sense of pride of where I was coming from, my sense of belonging, and what we were accomplishing here in our new community in Stanford, Connecticut. And at my young age, I had the huge privilege to study with a Russian master, one of the best violinists in our area. And she taught me a lot of my initial technique. And she also taught me what I know now about resilience, grit, and patience. But it wasn't always easy at that time. I remember one time she said to me, Angelica, why can't you play in tune? What's the matter with you? Can Ecuadorians not play violin? So I remember going back home and telling my mother, I don't want to play the violin anymore. I'm never going to be good enough. I want to quit. And she did not let me. And then I asked her even more questions as to if I had only been born here, if, if you had only just been here earlier, I would have been born blonde, blue eyes. We would have had more resources. And I don't understand. So obviously, at that time, I was very, very uh, not comfortable in my, with my own cultural identity. And that is when my journey began. But luckily, this chapter does have a happy ending because I won a full scholarship to go to college. And that was the beginning of me seeing that, OK, I can do this. And violin is what got me to here. So the main values that I see throughout my every day and throughout my life are that aspect of having courage, the aspect of turning these barriers into opportunities, the aspect of being uh, able to ask for help and being OK with that, and also creating that ripple effect that comes from moving from action, uh, from fear into action. Because uh, researcher Rena, Brené Brown says that courage is contagious. So when I went on to college, I was also, again, in a cultural shock and felt like I didn't really belong in, in, in college because I was failing my first music history exam. I was in class, and I did not understand how to study time periods. So it was hard for me to relate that, OK, Bach, a German composer, is from the Baroque period. Mozart, an Austrian composer, is from the Classical period. Tchaikovsky, a Russian master, is from the Romantic period. And Philip Glass, an American composer, is leading the 20th century movement in minimalism. But upper white European uh, upper class felt foreign and irrelevant to me. And I was saying, why am I not hearing names like Tania Leon or Chabuca Granda or Isolina Carrillo in this class? And is music history really complete without them? So I, I, I saw that being an immigrant, and I always felt in, that I was in two communities. One was my Latino community, my day-to-day uh, -day immigrant struggles community, and my other community was my classical music affluent community. So one day, I would find myself asked to translate at a community center for immigrant families who were signing up to get Thanksgiving baskets and food donated to them to feed their families. Another day, I would find myself uh, performing at a gala concert for classical music connoisseurs for whom what goes on in the South End and in our uh, areas is foreign or irrelevant to them, despite even living in the same city and even sharing the same zip code. So I realized that 
I really needed to preserve and promote my cultural identity because that was the only way that I was able to find a sense of myself and to make some sense of this, these two communities that I belong to. So why cultural identity, you may ask? As I was continuing into this music history class, um, we went on immediately from studying classical music and Western European composers, and my, my professor skipped music history from the Americas in for a matter of minutes, Latin American music and composers. And I felt that sense of, I'm not represented here, I don't see myself in this community, so I wanted to do something about it. And even when in college I found more Latino friends who spoke my same language and who shared that sense of missing our homes and being homesick, missing our food, missing our home-cooked meals by our parents, our rice with our Goya products. And we would just say, okay, you know, when in doubt, use Goya. But we found ourselves just in the cafeteria, uh, eating, eating cafeteria food. And that's when I also learned that although we have cultural similarities, and also our experiences also make us unique. So I learned that we are not a monolith. And that is when I really decided that my conviction was going to be to try to continue promoting cultural identity and cultural equity and aiming to use this to influence greater institutional change. So after college, I feel like I had it made. And you would think that, OK, I was playing in a symphony orchestra. I had a job. And I decided to quit. And I decided that I would take the road less traveled. Because I, I knew that if I didn't do this right now, if I let fear get in my way, I may have never done the next chapter of my life. So this is a picture of me being in the last orchestra, the, the last section of the violins when I was growing up. And notice there's only one Latina violinist and one black um, musician. So that was a reinforcement as to why I wanted to continue promoting uh, cultural identity and, and, and equity in my, in my professional life. So on May, 2000, May 27, 2011, I took the role as travel and decided to found the organization that is now called Intempo. And I really decided to make my conviction to make classical music and native instruments relevant, accessible, and inclusive. I decided to use what I had learned and all of these disappointments and sense of not belonging in this college ensemble that you're seeing here, you know, being the only musician of color, that I really wanted to replicate this into many others' lives. And I and that is when I became a cultural entrepreneur. So that was really when I also thought to myself that this aspect of having courage and not being afraid to make these life-changing decisions has truly made a huge difference in my life. And it's OK to be afraid. I think, please raise your hand if you've ever been afraid before making a huge life-changing decision. Right? So we all have that uh, same sentiment. And I would have thought, OK, I have zero resources. I have zero knowledge of this. I have zero opportunities. I could barely you know, learn English and write a five-page essay or exam, et cetera. But if we identify this community that's not being served right now, how can we use music to create a great equalizer and leverage the playing field? So that is when Intempo started. And I had another aha moment before this. I heard Bach, wonderful German composer, being played in these native instruments from South America called charango and sampoña. And I said, OK, if we do this and we combine violin and classical music, maybe then we could influence institutional change and get more people in higher places to be open to cultural identity and be willing to invest in something that will give them access to a broader diversity and many more communities and see that this is a viable value proposition. So now within Temple, we are truly committed to making classical music relevant, accessible, and inclusive by the use of native instruments. And this is our goal to not make music irrelevant to some, inaccessible to others, and exclusive only to those who could afford it. And in this concert hall, you're seeing over 150 musicians who may have never come together had it not been for this platform organization that truly reflects our community's shifting demographics. 
So right now, I've gone from being the only one Latina violin player in this orchestra to now having over 150 musicians that look like me, that speak my language, that come from Central, South America, Caribbean countries, India, reflecting this large immigrant population here, and just playing the same composer, the same music, and in, an, in a language and an instrument that comes from within them, from within their own cultures. And I think that had it not been for Intempo, some kids may not have had the opportunity to learn and practice their mother's native tongue, to explore and be confident and be empowered in their own cultural identity. And had I, been, had I let fear get in the way of this decision, I would have never had the courage to go about this. So in starting something out of nothing, I encourage you to have courage. Will you be courageous enough? Will you be able to turn your adversities into opportunities? Will you be afraid to ask for help if you need to figure something or a new business model out? And will you go from having that sense of now and turning that fear into an action that happens right now, today, because we'll be seeing many more results in the future. So I was also imagining, what if more people like you and more people in high places were open to cultural identity, and how could we propose a solution to our problem? America faces a big problem right now of divisiveness. And I want to propose the solution to divisiveness to be cultural identity and cultural equity. So I invite you now to imagine a world where we would all feel reflected and represented, where we would all find the courage to transfer our fears into actions. So as I've shared my journey through my own cultural identity, this is what has led me to start in Tempo. Had Intempo never existed, I think back now, these people that filled out this concert hall may have never come together. And the reason why they came was A, because they were invited, B, because they felt included, and also because they were taken into consideration in our programming. So this, is, this has been my journey in creating my Intempo. And I ask you now, what will be your journey to create greater institutional change, to find your own identity, and to find your own version of your own in temple. Thank you very much. Thank you.